Thank you so much, God, that nothing is too hard for you, that even with the number of people that, that, that just are part of our body that need prayer, uh, it's not overwhelming to you, it's not too big for you, it's not too hard for you, and God, we thank you that, and what Peter encourages, cast all of our cares on you, not some of them, not a few of them, but all of our cares, we can cast on you because, because you care for us, because you love us, nothing is too hard for you. Lord, we lift uh, at least a number of family members, uh, church family members, before you this morning. We ask for, for healing. We ask for peace. We ask for comfort and strength. God, that in the midst of their circumstances, may, may you be glorified. May, may the name of Jesus be lifted up. And, and those that are encountering uh, our family members, that, that they would encounter Jesus at the same time. That your name would be glorified, Father, that you will have your way in each of these circumstances and situations. We pray this morning for Pastor Larson at Christ the King Lutheran Church. I just pray your blessing on their services today. Pastor Larson, as he leads the congregation, Lord, that you will strengthen that body of believers. And use them within our community to, to, to spread the, the good news of Jesus. We pray for our churches in Panama. I pray for the Santiago campus today. And as, uh, as they meet virtually, uh, that their congregation will remain strong and focused on the message of the cross, the hope of salvation, strengthen it, and, and minister to that body of believers. We pray for Pastor Sonia today, who's again in the hospital, and they're looking for answers to what's happening in her body. We pray for wisdom for the doctors and for healing in her body this morning. We think of our missionaries around the world. We pray specifically for the for the. Darren's this morning in the country of Moldova. We pray your blessing on their ongoing work. Just a number of church building projects going on in that country. And that God, that you will help them to raise the funds and, and the workers that are necessary to see those buildings going up. And we pray for the Smiths, for Gary and Carol Jean, as they minister up in St. Cloud in two locations on both sides of the city. Lord, that your hand will be on those two churches. Strengthen, bless, encourage that as they continue to expand their ministry to, to a greater numbers of people within that community, Lord, that you will bless and encourage and strengthen them. And then we think of our church family members today, Lord, I pray for Ben and Tammy, Tammy Dahlberg. I pray you bless their marriage, their work, and the various places that they're at, and a lot of 
working from home. We pray for their kids, for Davis and Avery as they continue their studies at university. Uh, give them wisdom and grace and favor, Lord, as they study and keep this family whole and healthy. We pray as well for the Jensen's, Lord, for Josh and Beth. As Beth is in training for a new job, we just pray you bless that process for her. Strengthen and encourage, Lord, and we thank you for the gift that Josh has been for our children's ministry. We pray you continue to grow that ministry and, and just encourage him in his studies with the Minnesota School of Ministry. We pray for Lincoln this morning and Harrison, that these, these boys will grow into the men of God and be used of you. At every, every point of their development, that their, the love for Jesus will just flow out of them. We commit again, Lord, our service, our time together to you for your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We just encourage you to join with the worship team as they lead us in song this morning. There's no space that is love can't reach. There's no place where we can't find peace. There's no end to amazing grace. Take me in with your arms spread wide. Take me in like an orphan child. Never let go, never leave my side. I am holding on. In the middle of the 
Give me strength to make me grow. 
Your presence, Lord. 
Speak to our hearts as we look into your scripture this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated. A um, couple of things just to, to be aware of. Uh, council members, we're going to be postponing our, our we've had a meeting scheduled for Tuesday night, and we'll be pushing that back, and we'll get you a date set for that um, makeup meeting. It's probably connected with our October meeting. And then uh, other things just to be aware of, and the, um, this is the last uh, day, I think, or last couple of days to sign up for the Women's Conference. Ladies, if you're interested in, in uh, coming and watching the Women's Thrive Conference here at the church, um, you, can, you can still do that, but we need you to sign up this week and if you haven't already signed up for that. And uh, all that information is in the bulletin, so please be aware of that. <clears throat> And, excuse me, our annual missions convention is coming up. You'll, uh, we have tickets that we'll be able to have those uh, available. We're going to start getting distributed um, next week. So if you can be aware of that, we'd appreciate your attention to that. And be thinking about those days, October uh, 10th and the 11th. And we would love to have you um, come and be a part of those uh, special services of missionaries with us. We're going to let our uh, kids, ages 3 through 6th grade, be dismissed see Josh is heading out that direction now. I think Miss Sherry's got the junior church today. So all those uh, three, to three, three years old through sixth grade can be dismissed to go back to their class and, and have a special lesson for them this morning as well. <clears throat> well praise the Lord. I think uh, for, uh, I've been in, in ministry for about, uh, I, I don't know, about 30 years or a little more than 30 years and I have successfully evaded <laughs> preaching through the book of Revelation <laughs> for all of that time. Now, I've, I've preached a few messages from Revelation, um, but I, I've been successful in, in not doing a whole series and trying to cover the whole book, but it seems as that we're, that's where we're going. Um, you can see on the slide there, a systematic study through the book. We're going to try to do that, and I, I'm guessing um, that we'll, we'll be working through Revelation well into the new year. I, I'm, I'm going to guess that can't say that I've written all the messages out. I've got a very good idea where we're going, but I'm thinking we're probably looking at 22 or 23 weeks, probably. Um, so hang on, because we're you're going to hear a lot from Revelation over the next uh, several months. And so I did a couple of slides. If you could click on the next one, just uh, some things, some information you have. There's a little timeline piece kind of helps us to see where this is all at. You see Jesus is raising, rise, raised from the dead on, in AD 31. And then there's uh, some Roman emperors and all those things. We get over here to the, almost to the far right. You see John writes the book of Revelation in AD 90 to 95. Somewhere in that time frame is about where the book of Revelation was written. And, uh, and then you can see the destruction of the temple is in there back in AD 70. And just uh, some timeline information that's there. If you want to click on that next slide, this is kind of a, a basic outline of the book of Revelation. Um, the prologue, vision of Christ in the chapter 1, the messages to the seven churches, visions of heaven, and the uh, seven seals, the seven trumpets, powers of evil attack in the church, the seven bulls, uh, the fall of Babylon, the victory, and New Jerusalem, and the, the epilogue there at the very end of that. And we'll, we'll kind of work our way through all of that stuff. One more slide I think we have uh, that kind of helps us with that. And this is where the seven churches are located, kind of in Asia Minor there. You can see kind of on the map of roughly where they're in. You see the island of Patmos just off of the coast of, of Italy and just out in the sea there from, from the seven churches. It's, it's the Apostle John preached and, and pastored a church in Ephesus. And some of these other places that are mentioned here in the book, those things are there. We can go ahead and click on that next slide. And so this first week as we get going into this, we're just going to call this the unveiling. It's really an introduction to, to the book of Revelation and the first eight verses of chapter one really is kind of um, that unveiling, kind of that opening up of what's going on here. And it foretells those things that are going to come in the end times. We see vivid, vivid word pictures of what it will be like during the seven year time frame and we, we call the great tribulation with God's wrath being poured out on our planet along with the ultimate defeat of Satan and the Antichrist. And we also see heaven and the final state of humanity. 
Pastor Eugene Peterson has gone to be with the Lord now, but he described in his writings and his in his teaching, he describes the book of Revelation as the famous last words of Scripture. He says, Jesus spoke and the universe was created. Jesus spoke in Revelation and reveals himself to us in order for us to see, to hear, and obey. And there's going to be a kind of a reoccurring theme. You'll probably hear me say that as well again. That Revelation really is about Jesus. We're, we're going to talk more about that, and I hope you can kind of get some wrap your minds around that. Literally, what we see is that the book of Revelation ends with what began in the book of Genesis. In Genesis, the earth was created. In Revelation, the earth will pass away. In Genesis, the sun was to govern the day and the moon by night. In Revelation, there is no need for either the sun or the moon because God himself will be the light for us. In Genesis, we have the entrance of sin. In Revelation, we have the end of sin. In Genesis, the curse was pronounced. In Revelation, the curse is removed. And all things are made new. Praise God. In Genesis, death entered the world. And in Revelation, there is no more death. No more tears. In Genesis, we see Satan's first rebellion. In Revelation, we see Satan's last rebellion. In Genesis... Satan's doom was pronounced, and in Revelation, Satan's doom is executed. So when it comes to the book of Revelation, it seems to me that most often, some of you probably won't like this statement, <laughs> it seems to me that most often we, we tend to read and study the book of Revelation with wrong motives. We read it to study prophecy, that would be to say that we want to read about the sensational. We want to read about the doom and the gloom. We want to read about death and destruction. That's all foretold in this book. And then we, we like to try to match our current events to what we just read from the book of Revelation. It's not designed to do it that way. Just, I'm just going to tell you up front. That's not why Revelation was given to us. Now, don't get me wrong. We're going to see some of those very things. And we'll study and look at why, what they mean in our current time period. We'll see that our world, uh, our world today is on a downward spiral toward natural and economic disaster. But through it all, what we will see is that God is ultimately in control of everything. And so the main focus of the book of Revelation is the lordship of Jesus Christ. And please don't miss that, friends. Don't, the main emphasis of this book is the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You might want to write that at the heading of your Bible. When you get to the book of Revelation on the first page, just write down there, the focus of this book is the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Because if you miss that, you're going to miss everything that's important in this book. There I said it. <laughs> we, see, we see in the first five words, it says the revelation of Jesus Christ. Christ. It's not John's revelation, rather it's the revelation of Jesus Christ given to John by God himself. Furthermore, it's not the book of Revelations with an S at the end. Please make sure you notice that in the heading of the book as well. Rather, it's the book of Revelation. That is, this book is one single revelation given by God about Jesus and the end times. Seeing that it's the revelation of Jesus, this means that it's not only what's revealed by Christ, like his letters to the seven churches in the, in the next two chapters, chapters two and three, but it's also God's revelation about Jesus. It's kind of like our knowledge of Jesus to this point in our life is about this much. And then God gives us this revelation through John and expands our knowledge of Jesus to this much. We still can't know all there is to know about Jesus. It's just not possible. But until we get to Revelation, our slice of knowledge is of the years that he lived on this earth, right? We can read the Gospels and we have a limited knowledge, but then Revelation expands our knowledge about who he is and what he does. It's also this, this revelation that God gives to us. And so we're going to focus on the next, next week, we'll be focusing on uh, about who Jesus is as we finish up this chapter. So our main focus of this book is not the Apostle John. Nor is it the beast, or the Antichrist, or the false prophet, 
nor is it about the stuff that's going to happen during the time of the tribulation or during the millennium. Rather, the main focus of this book is Jesus. It's all about Jesus. That's the focus. We've got to be able to, as we read this book, we have to read everything in this book through the filter of Jesus. If you don't do that, you're going to miss the most important parts of this book. And this is, again, where I want to say, are you picking up a repetitive book? word here. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. Our lives aren't about us. Who is, who is, who is my life about? Jesus. Who is your life about? Jesus. It's all about Jesus. As we launch into this, I, I think, powerful study, we're going to be looking not so much for the sensational, but rather for the sovereign Lord. And we shouldn't be looking exclusively at our current events, but rather for our coming King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. But there's something more that is, um, while a blessing is received when we read or hear the words of this prophecy, these words must be followed and obeyed. It's not just enough to read what Revelation says. We have to keep what it says. It says there in verse 3, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and those who hear the word of this prophecy and keep what is written in it, because the time is near. Prophetic doctrine is only as good as when we connect it with our everyday lives and our responsibilities as Christians. There's a, a dirty word for most Christians, responsibilities. You, you mean God doesn't have all the responsibilities? No, he, he saves us and then gives us a whole list of responsibilities, things that we're supposed to do. Share our story. Tell others about Jesus. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Proclaim the name of Christ. We have responsibilities in this. And so we've got to get a hold of that. In other words, it's not how excited we get when we read and hear these things. Rather, it's how we work and walk them out once we hear them. Once we hear them. What are we going to do with what we've heard? We're going to begin to live this stuff out. This is also the only book in the Bible that contains this promise of blessing. It's probably the last, uh, the last book that's read. People have kind of shy away from this. I have for a long, long time. I've read it, but I don't want to preach on it. <laughs> and so we, we stick around as we're going to pause here. I want us to read Revelation, the first eight verses. I'm going to read from the Christian Standard Bible this morning just so you know where I'm coming from. We're going to start right at the beginning, go down to verse 8. The revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, whatever he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep what is written in it, because the time is near. John to the seven churches in Asia, grace and peace to you from the one who is, who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before the throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has set us free from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom, priest in God, to God his father and father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Verse 7. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. Verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord. The one who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. God, I just pray that as, uh, in this day, as we begin this larger study, open our hearts, our ears, help us to be alert, attentive to what you would say to us, to be able to grab a hold of these truths, apply them to our lives, to know Jesus better. Uh, God, I pray that throughout the, the coming weeks, as we continue through this study, that you'll help us, Lord, to, to see what you need for us to see, to, to then to act on those things, that we can be blessed because we've read it, and blessed because we've acted on it. In Jesus' name, amen. The word revelation is a Greek word, apocalypsis, 
man, I butchered that, meaning an uncovering or an unveiling. It, it's an unveiling of not only what is to come, but what must soon take place, according to Scripture, also of Jesus Christ, not only as he presently is in heaven, what we'll look at next week is where we're going to be there, but also of his coming again, and that's, that's found at the end of the book. I want us to see that it's about what must soon take place, meaning that which happens quickly or suddenly. The idea isn't that an event will occur soon, which I think far too many people have believed, even as far back as the early church, but rather, when it does come to pass, it's going to happen very quickly or suddenly. This is how the Apostle Paul describes the, the, describes the coming rapture of the church. Back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, you may want to flip a few pages back in your, in your scripture there. 1, 1 Thessalonians 4, I'm going to read verses 16 and 17. Paul says there, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a, with a shout, with the archangel's voice and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are also, who are still alive, who are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. The word rapture is Latin translation of Paul's Greek word for being caught up, or harpazo. The Greek word is harpazo. The idea, the concept of being caught up. We translate in English being raptured up. Which Paul describes over in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 52, and he says, in a moment. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, that's hypothesis, being caught up, the suddenness of that. And so these things that are going to soon going to happen isn't really about how the time frame of that, but how it happens quickly, in the moment, in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, it's, it's suddenly going to happen. Therefore, this event known as the rapture will happen very suddenly. In other words, one minute, we'll be right here. Right where we are. Maybe we're at work. Maybe we're at home. Maybe we're, we're at the grocery store. We're going to be here. And the next millisecond letter, later, we're going to be in the presence of Jesus. What soon must happen, that instantaneous peace, that's what is trying to be brought across for us. And the same goes for this time of the end. As John would describe it here, one moment, everything is going along as it always has. And then suddenly... The time of tribulation is upon us. This is a, a revelation. This book is a revelation of Jesus given to John through the intermediary of an angel. Now, we don't know exactly who the angel is. And while there are some who would speculate that it's Gabriel or Michael, as they, as they do their writing, there's nothing in the text to indicate that it was either of them. And quite honestly, it just doesn't matter. I'm pretty confident if God would have told us who the angel was, there would be a whole theology about the angel that brought the, the message. That's why it's, it's insignificant. It's unimportant. And it is through, it's thought that through the book of Revelation, it was written about uh, 96 AD, 95 AD, somewhere along in there when the Apostle Paul was now in his 80s, or about 65 years after Jesus called him to leave his fishing boat and become a fisher of men. He's riding out on the island of Patmos. We saw that, uh, that screen on the screen where Patmos is at. He's in exile on that small little barren island located out in the Aegean Sea, off the coast of Italy, southeast from Ephesus, which is where I mentioned earlier, John, had pastored the church there. The Roman emperor had banished John to Patmos for preaching the gospel, but before before he was banished, this has always been, been so intriguing to me. Before they actually banished John out to Patmos, because they were tired of him preaching the gospel and, and, and stirring up the world, they decided that they're going to shut him up. So they got a big cauldron of oil and got a big fire and they got the oil boiling and then they said, you're going to stop. He said, I can't stop. I've got to tell you what I've seen and heard. So they dumped him in the cauldron of boiling oil. Think about that. <laughs> And then, because he didn't die, okay, well, we're still going to get ready. We're going to send you out to Patmos and where everybody goes to die. And then, of course, we know the end of that is John didn't die in Patmos. He came back from Patmos and, and continued ministry and probably wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John after this. Um, but there was a lot of effort to, to silence John and his message of Jesus. 
But it was in the, there on Patmos in a cave that John was given the vision while spending some time in prayer. John is, is therefore bearing witness or giving testimony of everything that he heard and saw in visions as God spoke to him about Jesus. He, be, he begins by giving a greeting of grace and peace. Now, grace and peace, grace especially being the Greek method of greeting, while peace is the Hebrew form of greeting, and the, these two things form the two words of showing, giving the richness of how our faith is revealed through the grace and peace of Christ. There's such richness connected in those, in those words. God is... God's grace is unmerited favor given to people through the forgiveness he provides through Jesus Christ, through his sacrifice. As the Apostle Paul would exclaim that it's, it's by grace, through faith, that, and this is not from ourselves, it's God's gift. Not from works that, so that no one can boast. It's simply God's grace and mercy extended to us through the work of Jesus. And it's, it's from this grace that we can now have peace with God. It's peace that, that can only come through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, you may remember, in John 14, as he's talking with his disciples not long before the, 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 the ascension into heaven, Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled or fearful. So grace is our standing in Jesus, and peace is what we experience because of his grace that's been extended to us. Then we're, we're introduced to the Godhead, or what we would think of and call the Trinity. John begins in verse 4 with the Father, the one who is, who was, and who is to come. And we read in verse 8, I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God. The one who is, who was, and who is to come. The Almighty. This, is, this has brought a little bit of confusion for some people because it's also a description for Jesus. There's a struggle there. Oh, wait a minute. This is really Jesus. No, it's not Jesus. God identifies himself. I am the Lord Almighty. So, so, but we understand that Jesus and the Father are one. So they would have the same description, wouldn't they? The Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. Isaiah chapter 48, verses 12 and 13, the Lord is speaking and he says this, Listen to me, O family of Jacob, Israel, my chosen one, I alone am God, the first and the last. It was my hand that laid the foundations of the earth, my right hand that spread out the heavens above. When I call out the stars, they appear in order. Clearly, in that passage, God is speaking. But what he's, what, what's, it's what he goes on to say that brings God into a, a oneness, God's oneness to, to, a, to a, a highlight for us. Down in verse 16, it says there, come closer and listen to this. From the beginning, I have told you plainly what would happen. And now the sovereign Lord and his spirit have sent me with this message. All, all three persons of the Trinity. Jesus is talking in verse 16. God has sent me, the Spirit is with me, and they're sending me with a message. And further, the Apostle John in his gospel, the first chapter says, Jesus not only is the Word, that he was with God and was God, who was made flesh and dwelt among us. John also said that Jesus was the creator. John said in there, there in the first chapter, all things were created through him, and apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. So we're seeing the oneness of God. Jesus and the Father, they are one. We see them as separate, but they are one. The Holy Spirit is one with them. But to be sure that there are no misunderstandings, friends, this is this description somehow only applies to Jesus. Look, look what Jesus said about himself in John 14. Philip, you may remember at one point, Philip, here in John 14, Philip asked Jesus, just show us the Father, he said. Just show us the Father. That'll be enough for us. And Jesus said this in verse 9. He said, I've been among you all this time, and you still don't know me, Philip? The one who has sent me, uh, who has seen me, has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Really what he's saying, don't you understand that the Father and I are one? 
We're, we're the same. Why do I say verse 4 is a description back in Revelation 1 of the Father? Because it was of Jesus. Then what is stated in verse 5 becomes redundant when it says, and from Jesus Christ. So it wouldn't be from Jesus and from Jesus. It's from the Father and from Jesus Christ. The next we want us to see that the Holy Spirit, at the end of verse 4, it says, and the seven spirits before his throne. Now, this, that, that statement has kind of perplexed a lot of people over the years, and I feel it, as I study through this, it clearly references the Holy Spirit. First, the number of seven in the biblical numerology is the number of God, and the number of divinity. There's also the sevenfold work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the coming Messiah, as described by the prophet Isaiah. It was the Holy Spirit that, that descended upon Jesus after his baptism. John the Baptist bore witness of this, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. And then it says, and that the Holy Spirit led Jesus out into the wilderness for 40 days. And then he came back from the wilderness under the power of the Holy Spirit and began his ministry. And then finally we see this, this portion of greeting, in, in the final portion of greeting in verse 5, it says, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. There's three aspects mentioned at the end of that verse that reveal who Jesus is, which is then followed up by Jesus' present work. We're going we're gonna to look at those three aspects to begin with. First of all, he's the faithful witness. Jesus said to Philip, if they had seen him, then they had seen the Father. In his earthly life, Jesus was the faithful witness of God. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. No one's going to see the Father except they see me. The only way we can see God, because God is spirit, is to see Jesus. Also, there's what... When Pilate asked Jesus, are you a king? And Jesus responded, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is on this side of truth hears my voice. That's John 18, 37. And then we see that Jesus is preeminent. He's preeminent. This is, this is, this is, um, Seeing when it says, he was the firstborn from the dead. Jesus was the firstborn from the dead. We've got to get a hold of that. In other places, Jesus is called the first fruits of those who rise from the dead. And is followed by all of those who believe in him at his coming. Jesus was, was indeed the first one who was resurrected with an incorruptible body. Now we know that Lazarus was brought back to life when Jesus on the fourth day. Lazarus came back to him. We, we know about the widow's son of that name. Those two people came back to life at Jesus, but they both died again, didn't they? But Jesus was the first one who was resurrected and has never died again and will never die again. He's the firstborn of the dead. That's what it's talking about. The firstborn who is risen with an incorruptible unending life. How powerful is that? And, and, and that's something that we, friends, are going to experience at the rapture. And then those who, who are remaining, who believe at the fullness of the second coming, because I really believe the second coming, um, there's a rapture of the church, and then seven years later, after the tribulation, there's the second coming of Christ. I really believe that's all one event, but it happens so fast in such a short period of time on the eternal time span, we see a big gap there. But seven years in God's eyes, that's like a blink of the eye. And so the fullness of the second coming, those who have survived the great tribulation and believe in Christ and walk in, they're going to experience this newness of life, this, this resurrected life as well as those who have been raptured up seven years earlier. It doesn't mean, however, that Jesus was the first one born. The Mormons would contend that Jesus was the first one ever born, but rather he is preeminent. And this, this is what that, the word firstborn means in the Greek. The, the word is protokos. It means that that which is given preference over or that which is first in order. 
Then the third piece that we see mentioned there in, in, in Revelation 1.5 is that Jesus is the ruler. It says there that he is ruler over the kings of the earth. The psalmist talks about how the kings of this world would set themselves against the Lord and his son, who is called the anointed or the Messiah. And then the Lord tells them to bow down to the Messiah so that they won't perish. As we, excuse me, as we see the ending of this, when Jesus returns upon him are these words written. It says they're written on his clothing and on his thigh. King of kings and Lord of lords. You'll see it in Revelation 19, 16. And after this description of Jesus being the faithful witness, the preeminent one and ruler over the kings of this earth, we're introduced to Jesus' mission. And from this, we see a couple of significant things. His mission is to forgive us. He forgives us. To him who loves us, in verse 5, to him who loves us and has set us free from our sins by his blood. Jesus, friends, Jesus loved us so much that he gave his life for us. That is, he shed his blood so that our sins could be forgiven. Hebrews tells us there is no forgiveness without shedding of blood. Hebrews 9, in fact, Le Leviticus, even the Old Testament, Leviticus 17 tells us the same thing. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. The Apostle John writes in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, If we walk in the light as he himself, speaking of Jesus, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. So the first thing we see that Jesus does when he comes, when we come to believe in him, to trust in him, when we repent of our sin, is he forgives us of our sin when we confess. And then he gives us our mission. There's the responsibility word again. Our mission. Well, mission is responsibility. Isn't it, John? If you've got a mission from your boss, you've got responsibilities to fulfill that mission, don't you? So he gives us our mission. First part of verse 6 says, and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. Jesus gave us our mission as the Great Commission. To go and make disciples of all nations. To teach them to observe everything I've commanded you. Of course, that's Matthew 28, 19 and 20. The Apostle Peter tells us that this is done through our new identity. In fact, you may want to go over and look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. As Peter explains some of our mission, 1 Peter 2, 9, it says there, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And isn't that, isn't that exactly the Great Commission? Proclaiming the good news of Jesus? We, we have a mission, friends. We have a mission. It's, it's so that everyone can know that God loves you so much that what? John 3, 16. He sent his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. That's our mission. That's our responsibility to make sure that the people that we work with people that we go to school with, the people that we run into, hopefully we don't run into them in the parking lot, but we, we, we meet them at the grocery store, we meet them at the department store, whatever, when the people we meet, that, that they have an opportunity to know who Jesus is, that, that this whole thing, our, our eternal destiny is wrapped up in who Jesus is, and our ability and willingness to trust him and to seek him and to worship him. When John ends this section of verses, these eight verses, by saying that Jesus is not only the faithful witness, the firstborn from dead, not only is he the King of kings and Lord of lords, and the one who forgives us and gives us a purpose, but that he is coming back. He is coming back. Verse 7. I love that verse. Look, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, <clears throat> And all the tribes of heaven, uh, of earth, will mourn over him. And I have to kind of wonder, but why, why mourn at such a joyous occasion? I think mainly because that which is known to those who witness his coming is that Jesus was indeed the Christ, the Messiah, 
the one in whom their sins are forgiven, and the one who then ushers them into heaven, and they missed it. And they missed it. He could have forgiven me of my sin. He could have taken me deep, but I, I didn't trust him. I didn't, I didn't repent. I wouldn't. It's actually brought out by the prophet Zechariah, and we'll end with this last verse, Zechariah 12.10. You may want to take a peek at that as well. Zechariah says, Then I will pour out a spirit of grace and prayer on the house of David and on the residents of Jerusalem, and they will look at me whom they pierced. They will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly for him as one weeps for a firstborn. Again, there in Zechariah, they mourn because they realize that the Messiah they've been praying for had already come. And it was no one less than Jesus who they crucified. As we end, as we end our introduction this morning, my hope is, the hope is that you're going to continue to, through this incredible passage, I encourage you, just be reading Revelation. You may have other stuff that you're reading, other devotional stuff. Hope you're reading through the 21 day of prayer book. There are other things that you can read, but take time, take a little extra time, and just keep reading Revelation. You may want to focus in on the next, the, the last part of chapter one for next week. That's where we're going to be next week. But my hope is that, 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 that you're going to continue to read through this book with me. And, and since it, it seems to be such a hot topic in our world, and uh, there's things that apply maybe to our world that many wonder about the meanings of what it's all going to be saying and what it's all about. Maybe, maybe you're going to find a way to invite a friend or a family member to join us over the next 20 weeks or 21 weeks as we continue through this study and uh, give them a chance to hear and learn more about Jesus. Because ultimately, well, there's other stuff that's in the book. Ultimately, even the other stuff that's in the book is about Jesus. It's going to point us, if we miss that piece, if we don't see those things through the lens of Jesus, we're going to see it incorrectly. So we'll, we'll try to do that over the next uh, number of weeks as we continue through this series. Father, thank you for your word. And even as we've begun this larger study, I pray, God, that you'll just continue to draw us in to your presence. That you'll continue to help us to uh, have open eyes and ears, hearts to, to hear, to see Jesus in the midst of all of the things that are going to happen as we read through this book, as we study through this, this incredible book. Um, help us to see it all and understand it all through your heart and, and through the, the lens of Jesus. God, be glorified in our lives, be glorified through our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we we'll encourage you, invite you to stand. We'll sing this uh, song, Susan's going to lead us in, and then we'll, we'll close and dismiss.